just going to bring up uh, the solutions here. Um, I'll show you how I did it. You may not have created your cable exactly the way I did, um, but uh, I'll show you uh, how I did it. Um, all right, so this is uh, the table. Um, you'll notice that uh, I have quantity there uh, all the way to the left. Uh, I have total cost there, and then I have all of my other uh, cost statistics um, f uh, further on out. Um, and really, the whole point of this is just to uh, have you kind of go through, it's almost sort of an accounting exercise, uh, just so you can kind of see the behavior of costs uh, given a very sort of simplistic cost function, um, for example. And, and everything sort of behaves here the way we would expect. In fact, if you look at the beginning, uh, we actually get that dip uh, in average total and average variable cost, but they actually start out really low. And then as you increase your consumption, you can see that our costs uh, start to uh, increase uh, uh, quite considerably. Um, and if we were uh, to, to continue to produce um, and produce more and more and more, you would see those costs increase uh, precipitously thrown out. And so there's a lot, of, again, this is a relatively boring uh, particular exercise. It's not super interesting on the surface. But again, this is something that businesses do all the time. They, they really try to understand their cost structure. It's something that I think students can often take for granted. Um, if, you know, now, if you've worked in a business, if you've owned a business, or if you've done these sorts of analyses for a business, then you know what I'm talking about. But most of us have not. I had never done it until I was uh, an economist. And, um, you know, for example, like I've done some consulting um, with uh, small businesses, and usually the first thing I ask them is to, for them to kind of tell me what their cost structures are. You know, what, what, what is your business costing you? Where are your sources of costs coming from? Um, are they mainly overhead, things like fixed costs, which are sort of really hard to avoid? Um, or are your costs more variable? In other words, do you have a lot of control over what your costs are doing uh, in, in, in sort of from the short run to the long run? And again, it's just sort of a very general exercise. And really here, it's just to kind of make sure that you sort of understand the relationship uh, between the different things. Um, some shortcuts that you could have taken here, for example, is that we know by looking at this particular equation, um, there is a variable cost component uh, to this equation, and there is a fixed cost component um, to this equation. So the variable cost component is the part of the cost equation uh, that uh, has a Q associated with it. In other words, this is the part of the cost that increases as the firm produces more. That's the variable cost portion um, of the total cost function. Uh, and then, of course, this $1,000 here refers to the firm's fixed cost, right? So this is a cost they can't avoid. Notice that even if the firm produces zero, as we see in the, the first line, or the second row, rather, um, of this particular table, we'll notice that uh, despite the fact that the firm produces nothing, uh, they uh, still have a total cost of 1000 uh, Of course, that cost has to include the fixed cost. Um, and, and again, this is uh, a fairly important thing for businesses to know. Um, as we've talked about in class, the shutdown point of a firm in the short run is tied directly to its ability to cover its fixed costs, for example. Um, and so understanding what fixed cost is uh, is, is a very important component, uh, but also very easy. Usually we can just look at the cost function uh, and see quite directly uh, from there. And then the, the sort of most important thing um, from a cost perspective um, is this marginal cost component, right, uh, where we're just looking at the change in costs uh, as we produce each additional unit of our product. Um, and you can see uh, that sort of behavior of marginal cost, you know, makes sense here in this context. It is increasing uh, over time, as we would expect. And this, of course, factors in um, to uh, at least one other question. Well, so, okay, that's a good question, right? So if I look at my total, uh, if I look at my variable cost, Again, my variable cost is two, uh, Q squared minus 2Q. Um, I know average variable cost is variable cost divided by Q. So if I just take Q squared minus 2Q and I divide it by Q, I have Q minus 2. So that's what I say. That's why I say that average variable cost is Q minus 2. Because it's, again, average variable cost is variable cost divided by Q. Variable cost is Q squared minus 2Q. If I divide that value by Q, what I have left is Q minus 2. Did I show you how to do that? Is this 
have to know I don't need it. But even if you didn't know that it was Q minus 2, as long as you were able to calculate your average variable cost, or excuse me, var variable cost rather, you could then just divide variable cost by Q, and it would give you the same answer. So you mean, it, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, yeah. You certainly didn't need to find that average variable cost was Q minus 2, although at the same time, I would hope that you could figure out that average variable cost was indeed Q minus 2. Questions? Yeah, we have questions here. And by the way, you know, again, like average variable cost is Q minus 2 here, not because average variable cost is always Q minus 2. It's Q minus 2 in this particular case with that particular cost base. All right, so um, the second question, or uh, once we did all the, the, the average cost, uh, marginal cost, and everything, uh, then this was sort of the question that I got a lot of I got a lot of questions about myself. Um, and what, assuming the market price is eighteen dollars, uh, how many barrels uh, would uh, the brewery produce? Now, uh, if you did your one through ten, like I asked you to do, you'll notice that marginal cost is set here at two hundred and seventeen dollars. Uh, you'll recall that profit maximization uh, is at marginal revenue over marginal cost. Since uh, the market price uh, for this uh, uh, for uh, beer is eighteen dollars, um, we want to find where marginal cost is eighteen dollars. Um, and so, uh, you, if you'll notice, you'll say, "Well, okay, hold on." But if you go, you know, zero through ten, uh, the tenth unit is seventeen dollars for marginal cost. Well, if you just computed one more unit. Um, down, you would see that, that that marginal cost is 19. So the profit maximizing quantity, uh, you know, the, the sort of most correct answer would be between uh, 10 and 11. Um, I, of course, would have accepted 10 units, 10 and a half, 10 and 4, 10 and 11 units um, in this particular answer. But again, the point of that exercise was for you to sort of explore, kind of put a puzzle together that was, okay, we have market price. I know that I need marginal revenue, which is market price, to equal marginal cost. So let me find where marginal cost is equal to um, marginal revenue, which would be $18. Um, and so when I do the math, uh, I see that uh, the marginal cost of the 10th unit is $17. The marginal cost of the 11th unit is 19 Therefore, uh, somewhere between 10 and 11 units is a profit maximizing quantity uh, for this particular brewery. Question. that part of the video because it's annoying. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, so the second question uh, dealt with uh, the short run cost curves um, of Old Crow Medicine Show, uh, a band in the perfectly competitive music market. Um, you know, whether you believe the music market is perfectly competitive is not that important for this particular question. We're going to assume that it is. Make sure you understand the concept. If you understand the concept, then how to calculate things flows directly uh, from there. Okay, um, so uh, this first uh, question on um, question two says, suppose that the current market price uh, is for music is a dollar, $150 uh, per minute. Uh, what are the profits? Um, so we need to do a couple things here. We need to find what the profit maximizing quantity is um, for the band. Uh, we also need to find out what average total cost is at that particular quantity. Once we have that, we'll be able to, ca to calculate profits. Profit maximization occurs where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Um, so profits are, of course, made up of two co components. We have total revenue and total cost. So uh, we just need to compute total revenue and then compute total cost, uh, and then we can subtract those from each other to get um, our profit outcome. Uh, again, at this particular market price, it's important to point out that we're calculating profits at a given price. Um, you remember uh, our conversation about perfect competitors uh, was that these firms are subject to prices. They respond to market prices by producing a profit maximizing amount. So in this particular situation, the profit maximizing amount is 1,000 units. Um, so when we actually calculate profits, again, we want two components. Um, we have total revenue here, um, which is that $150 per minute um, price. 
times the profit maximizing quantity of a thousand units. That's our total revenue. Now for total cost, I just need to remember that total cost is equal to average total cost times quantity, right? Average total cost times quantity is total cost. I know this because uh, average total cost is equal to total cost divided by Q. So if I just rearrange that equation, if I solve that equation for total cost, I get that total cost is equal to uh, average total cost times Q. Uh, and again, we want to calculate uh, total cost at the profit maximizing quantity. So what I do is I take this thousand units, which is the profit maximizing quantity, I go straight up to uh, the average total cost curve. Uh, I go over and I can see that in this particular scenario, average total cost is equal to $76. So $76 times uh, 1,000 is going to give me total cost for this particular firm. And when I do that, um, I get uh, that profits for Old Crow Medicine Show are equal to $74,000. So you can see that we have total revenue, which is the $160 times 1,000 minus total cost, which is 76 times 1,000. Uh, so when we do the math there, we get profits of $74,000. Questions? about any of that. I promise you, okay, here's just why I lied a second ago. I promise you, you will need to calculate profits on the exam. I'm gonna be perfectly honest. That's what you need to do. You need to do that. I promise you, you'll have to do that. So any questions about how I got these numbers, where I got them, anything? Cool, all right, great. Um, question B says, now suppose that uh, due to uh, the profits we just calculated, a number of dubiously talented New England Southern transplant bands enter the market and are perceived homogenous to Old Crow Medicine Show. As a result, the market price falls to $50. Uh, what are their profits now? Again, same exact exercise. Um, we look at a price of $50 as our marginal revenue, and we see that it intersects our marginal cost curve uh, right here um, at, at B, at point B. Um, we take that straight down. We can see that at a market price of 50, uh, profit maximizing quantity for uh, Old Crow Medicine Show is 800 units. So in order to maximize profits, they would produce uh, 800 units of music, again, at a market price um, of 50. Uh, so we have total revenue, which is 50 uh, times 800 units. Now we just need to find what total cost is. Again, I take my profit maximizing quantity, I go straight up to my average total cost curve, which is right here. I take that straight over, and I can see that average total cost at uh, 800 units um, is equal to uh, $60. So total cost, therefore, would be $60 times 800 units. Um, and when I do this, uh, you'll see that I have profits. Uh, again, here's my total revenue. That's that market price times the profit maximizing quantity of 800 minus the average total cost times the profit maximizing price again, and I get negative $8,000. So at a market price uh, of $50, uh, $50 uh, the profit uh, maximizing quantity decision for Old Crow Medicine Show is 800 units, um, but we see at 800 units they actually uh, make a loss. Their profits are less than zero. Now, what can happen sometimes is that students will compute profits less than zero, and they'll think they've done something wrong. Again, this is one of the mistakes that students often make, is that they think of profits as always just being greater than zero. Um, remember, any time the marginal revenue curve is below the average total cost curve, right? So if we look at this, we can see that marginal revenue falls below the average total cost curve. When that occurs, uh, profits will be less than zero, right? That, that's just always going to be the case. So if marginal revenue falls below um, average total cost, then profits are going to be less than zero. So um, that, in a sense, should have been what we expected to occur even before we calculated profits. So this has been one of those things that I've, I've again, I, wanted, I want to try to get around the technical complexity um, of this graph because it's, it's a lot going on here. And again, one of the things that happens is that students, you, you know, your eyes look at this, and I think this is just the way our brains work, we sort of take the whole thing in. And if you take the whole thing in, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of numbers, there's arrows pointing to things. So the key, and I think this is the key of really any discipline, 
is to teach you the material such that you can look at this graph and instead of seeing everything at once, you can see things in a sort of particular way. And, and the way that I think is the most helpful to see here is just think about things in terms of those marginal revenue curves, right? We have three marginal revenue curves. There's one at 150, there's one at 50, and there's one at 15, okay? Uh, you don't really have to pay attention to much else because we know that profit maximization occurs when those lines intersect our marginal cost curve. So that narrows down kind of what you're paying attention to. And this is one of the things that I always found very comforting about economics. And I think one of the things that, that led me to be a, a, a fairly successful economics student was that I, was, I did this quickly. I was able to kind of see that um, really all I'm interested in is actually a few number of points here. There's only three points of interest here. There's only three marginal revenue curves. There's only three profit maximizing outcomes. Um, so don't, don't you know, this is, this is very similar to supply and demand. You know, we want to be able to break down uh, the graphs, make them simpler, uh, as opposed to kind of treating them like they're, they're sort of too, uh, they're kind of beyond our understanding, which I think some students tend to do, which I, is, is unfortunate. I think some students, you know, if you, if you come into the class, and, and I've heard this from so many of you so many, so often this, this semester, and, and not just this class, but in all other classes, students will say, uh, oh, I'm just not good at math. I just, I hate that, right? Because you, the reason you probably feel that way is because you didn't have good math teachers um, or someone told you really young that you weren't good at math and you just have believed them your whole life. Um, now, certainly there are folks with better quantitative skills than other folks, but I think that if you feel like you're not good at math, what, what you're probably doing is you're not giving, A, you're not giving yourself enough credit. You probably can understand more than you think. Just by thinking that you're bad at math is probably causing you to understand less than you otherwise would. I mean, the second thing is that by saying you're bad at math, you're sort of elevating it to, to this very hard to understand thing. Um, and in and, and reality, and especially in this context of economics, it shouldn't be, it's not that it shouldn't be difficult, it, it is difficult, but it, it should be navigable. You should be able to kind of, you know, swim through and look at the various points that are important. Uh, and again, just kind of break things down. Realize that what we're interested in is marginal revenue equaling marginal cost, and so I can kind of focus on that. Questions? Okay, so um, perhaps the most uh, complicated one would be C, um, and it says that basically because uh, digital music and online music, uh, this means that basically uh, there are so many bands that enter the market that the market price gets pushed way down. So uh, what are Old Crow Medicine Show's profits uh, when the price falls to $15 is the next question. This one is a little bit more difficult because, um, well, on one hand, it's more difficult. Uh, on the other hand, it's actually a lot easier. Um, the fact is, is that uh, at $15, because that marginal revenue is below uh, average variable cost, um, this means that it's below the firm's shutdown point. So the fact is, is that because marginal revenue is below average variable cost, then in fact, Old Crow Medicine Show wouldn't produce any music at all they would in fact choose to uh, produce zero uh, and then just pay their fixed cost. Because if marginal revenue is below average variable cost, this means that, for example, if they were to produce at 200 units, they wouldn't even cover their fixed cost. Their losses would be greater than if they had just produced nothing and instead paid their fixed cost. Um, and so really the answer, uh, the sort of correct answer to this particular question would be that at a market price of $15, um, Old Crow Medicine Show would actually choose to produce zero units. As a result, their profits would be negative fixed costs. So whatever their fixed costs are, their profits would be negative that amount. Uh, so, for example, if we went back to the previous example of the brewery, and if this was the same situation for them, their profits would be negative $1,000. Right? Now, I think I saw some people were very adventurous, and they actually uh, uh, attempted to calculate of uh, what fixed costs were to actually give that uh, a number, and I commend you on that. Um, you actually, I don't I need to look at the graph. Um, it would be hard to do it, but if you could compute um, average fixed cost at, at any given, okay, so you, I, eh. if you could compute average fixed cost at any given point, you can then multiply that by Q, and that would tell you what your total fixed cost is. Uh, it's very hard to do it because I don't have, uh, any lines drawn over here in terms of the variable cost curve. So I can just calculate the distance between total cost and average variable cost. 
and then multiply that value by Q, and it would tell me what my fixed costs are, but you can't do that here. So um, it, again, kind of the answer to this question is profits would be negative fixed costs. That's when, yeah. Yeah, so remember, we there's like, there's, you know, if marginal revenue is above average total cost, profits are greater than zero, right? If marginal revenue is below average total cost, profits are negative. And if marginal revenue is below average variable cost, then the firm exits the market. The firm will, does what we call shuts down. All right, so in this particular graph, what you see, I sort of set it up for you, right? You have the, the, the break-even point, which is at the minimum of average total cost. Um, so you can think about, like, if marginal revenue was at the break-even, right, that would be right here. So imagine that marginal revenue here um, happens to be $54.50, um, then this firm would break even, uh, for example, right, because uh, total revenue would be just equal to total cost. Now, if marginal revenue was greater than $54.50, the firm would earn positive profits, right, greater than zero profits. Um, if marginal revenue is less than $54.50, again, in this particular scenario, then the firm earns negative profits, right? But the firm will continue to produce, even if they're earning negative profits, um, as long as marginal revenue is greater than average variable costs, uh, which is why we call this point right here the shutdown price. Um, so if the shutdown price, uh, say if the market price was $21 or less, uh, then the firm would choose to produce nothing because it's below their shutdown point. And again, the, the importance of the shutdown point is that this is where the firm does not cover their fixed costs. It's, you know, it's been a while since we did perfect competition, so that's probably one reason uh, that, that maybe you're a little rusty on this. Uh, but really kind of refer back to this graph. And again, remember, we're thinking about this in the context of different marginal revenues. So if marginal revenue uh, intersects marginal cost above average total cost, then we have greater than zero profits. If uh, marginal revenue intersects marginal cost directly at the break-even point. So for example, again, if marginal revenue was $54.50, uh, then Todd's terrific takeaway uh, would earn zero profits. Um, and so in a sense, this is what firms are really interested in, right? Firms are interested in their break-even prices. What is the market price that I need to at least make zero profit? Because um, firms don't want to make losses. Uh, and of course, preferably, firms would, would make greater than zero profits. Uh, so we would actually want, you know, Todd's terrific takeout would want marginal revenue to be greater than $54.50. Of course, we know that because this is perfect competition, if uh, their uh, marginal revenue is greater than $54.50, uh, this would mean that Todd's making profits, uh, and that would likely cause firms to enter the market, which would actually push his profits down um, over time because marginal revenue would fall. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so in a sense, that's kind of what we expect to happen sort of in the long run, right? So in this, this is the example um, that I went over in class um, from, from that same sort of setup. Uh, and it was like, let's assume that for, for at first, uh, marginal revenue was $70. Uh, at, at a marginal revenue of $70, we saw that Todd's terrific takeout earned greater than zero profits, right? Again, because marginal revenue is above average total cost. Um, but if we expect firms to enter the market, for example, uh, which we did in this scenario, we see that marginal revenue would fall. Again, because marginal revenue is equal to market price. Right? Just ask yourself, what happens when firms enter a market? Well, when firms enter a market, this pushes the supply curve out. Right? And you remember from supply and demand, when the supply curve is pushed out to the right, all else equal, prices fall. Right? As more firms enter the market, we expect prices to fall. So when market prices fall, Obviously, that also means marginal revenue falls. It's really the same thing. Um, now we see that uh, Todd's terrific takeout, in fact, earns less than zero profits because marginal revenue is below average total cost. So the question I ask you, it's sort of a weird question. So I ask you to kind of imagine that ultra measure show makes it into the long run, that they're, they're a firm that makes it into the long run. So what I'm kind of challenging you to do is think about what this would mean. Um, and what it would mean is that um, if we go back up to the cost uh, structure, because we know that under perfect competition, um, firms need to make at least zero profits, right? In the long run, the shutdown point is just the break even. If the, firm, uh, if the firm's not earning uh, zero or greater than zero profits, in the long run, they'll shut down. So if we make the statement, imagine that ultra measure show lasts into the long run, then we know that they're at least breaking even. 
And then the other component we know about firm competition is that we expect the market to equilibrate where all firms earn zero profit. Right? That's the end result of perfect competition. The long-run profit condition under perfect competition is profits go to zero for all remaining firms. So in other words, we know that if Old Crow Message Show makes it in the long run of the perfectly competitive market, it must mean that they're earning zero profit because that's the zero profit outcome of perfectly competitive market. So then the question just becomes, where does Old Crow Message Show earn zero profit? At approximately what market revenue and at approximately uh, what level of production? So I just look at this, and again, the break-even point is the minimum of average total cost. Okay, so the minimum of average total cost is like right here. This would be a marginal revenue around $60, maybe a little bit greater than $60. Um, and it would be a uh, quantity uh, maybe a little bit greater than 800 minutes. So in the long run, Old Crow Medicine Show would face market prices around $60 and would produce around 800 units uh, of music. Furthermore, because they make it in the long run, we also know that they are a zero profit firm, right? That they earn zero profits in the long. So uh, in this particular one, um, I have a lot of, uh, I have like some, some assistance here with some nice colorful graphs, which we'll talk about here in just a second. A lot of the same logic sort of carries over from this. Um, so the first question is to calculate producer and consumer surplus under the monopolist. I've not asked you to calculate consumer and producer surplus in a while, um, but it's an important uh, thing to talk about in the context um, of the monopolist. So I'm just going to go ahead and take you down. Um, so here is producer and consumer surplus um, under this monopolist. Um, oh. Make this just a little bit small. Um, so uh, the thing here is that you, 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 know, you got to remind yourself of the definitions of consumer and producer surplus. Uh, consumer surplus is the added value that flows to consumers who pay prices below their uh, maximum willingness to pay. Uh, because the monopolist is putting upward pressure on prices, this means that consumer surplus is going to fall. Um, and because it's the monopolist, we also know that producer surplus is most assuredly uh, going to rise, uh, or most likely going to rise, I should say. Um, and so uh, in this particular scenario, uh, your, your consumer surplus is here. It's just the area above market price, below the demand curve, uh, and out to the point of consumption, which here is 300 units. Um, so this triangle right here represents consumer surplus. Again, it's the area above price, below demand, and out to the point of consumption. Okay, that's consumer surplus always. That's the broadest definition of consumer surplus. Right? Above price, below demand, and out to the point of consumption. Right? That's always true. Uh, producer surplus is the area below price. Uh, greater than, I should say, uh, sorry, uh, below price, above supply, uh, which here is marginal cost, and out to the point of consumption once again. So for producer surplus, we get kind of this uh, sort of trapezoidal, uh, sort of wonky looking um, uh, shape, but we can easily break this up into uh, a square and a triangle here because we know what this is here at three. Um, and so if we do that, um, this first part here is the triangle. Um, so this is sort of a triangle right here. Um, and then the second part um, is, the, uh, uh, is the rectangle. Um, and so we just add those together, and we get that producer surplus is equal to uh, 1,300 units. Um, now, are there any questions about consumer and producer surplus here? So hopefully it was a little bit of a review. Great. All right. So the second question asks us, uh, what are Kevin's profits? Um, so we'll go back up here to the original curve here. Uh, and uh, again, we need uh, to know essentially um, two things. We need to know what the profit maximizing quantity is for, for Kevin. We need to know what he charges. Um, and then we can, again, use that average total cost like we have before uh, to calculate profits. Um, so under the monopolist, we know that marginal revenue um, equals marginal cost. That's where profit maximization occurs. So that occurs right here at point B. So we can see that profit maximizing quantity for Kevin uh, is 300 units. Um, and so then what we have to do is we have to calculate uh, what um, the what profit, not, not well, calculate it, but we want to find out what profit max maximizing price is uh, for Kevin. So we take uh, 300 units and we go straight up to the demand curve. 
over so we can see that the profit maximizing price for Kevin uh, is $6. So Kevin would charge $6 uh, and sell 300 units. Um, and so th in this way, we can see that Kevin's total revenue uh, is just $6 times 300 units or $1,800. So Kevin's total revenue is $1,800 because he sells 300 units at a price of $6. Okay? Questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, 75 cents. Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, we look for average total cost at the profit maximizing quantity. So at 300 units, average total cost is 75 cents. So therefore, total cost is 75 cents times 300 units. Right? Yeah. So when we calculate profits, we get, that's the, that's the price they charge, $6. Here's the profit maximizing quantity, 300 units. Oh, wait a minute. This is a, there's a typo here. I need to fix this. This uh, this should be 75 cents right here. So I'll uh, I'll fix that typo before I post these solutions. So I, that's another thing. I'm going to post these solutions to Blackboard. So I'll fix that typo. That was a mistake on my part. So yeah, this should be 75 cents times 300 units. So ignore that profits there. I got caught. I was probably trying to speed through this. All right. Um, Question C says, uh, how much is dead weight loss? Again, this is just one of those things where there's a lot going on, but you just want to kind of like simplify your life uh, so you're only looking um, at what you need to look at. Again, uh, dead weight loss is always calculated as like the discrepancy uh, between profit, uh, competitive market equilibrium and any other non-competitive market equilibrium. In this scenario, we're talking about the monopolist outcome. Um, so we just look at the discrepancy between um, the, the perfect co competitive outcome, which is 450 units, and a, and a price of $4.50. Uh, um, we compare that to the monopolist outcome, which is 300 units uh, and a price of $6. Again, we get that less bang for more buck uh, result under the monopolist. Uh, so instead of 450 units, we only get 300 units. So that, that is the base of our dead weight loss triangle. So the base of our dead weight loss triangle uh, is 150 units. Um, and then the height of our dead weight loss triangle um, is equal to the, di the difference between profit maximizing price for the monopolist and their marginal cost, which is $3. So if we go back up here, we can see that profit maximizing price is 6 and marginal cost is 3. Again, marginal cost at the profit maximizing quantity uh, is $3. So again, here we can see this is dead weight loss. And then in this particular uh, graph, we can see that I, I have it here shaded in blue. So dead weight loss is uh, one half 150 times three, uh, which is $225. Uh, Questions? And again, I'll post solutions to this. I'll also post a, uh, uh, at least uh, a couple more examples of this on Blackboard as well. So you'll, you should have plenty of things to kind of study uh, as we go. And also, if you've, if you've paid attention, um, I posted a bunch of stuff to the Blackboard site. Um, so if you actually look at it, um, if you go to documents, I got a lot of stuff here for you. So exam study material, perfect competition, monopolies, monopolist competition, oligopoly. So if, you're, if you need things to study uh, ahead of the final, I would definitely look through these slides. They will definitely get, get you a lot of the pertinent information that you need. And again, cross-reference these with your lecture notes, what we talk about in class. Because, of course, that's the most important thing at the end of the day, what I actually talked about in class. All right. So um, this, is, uh, uh, this is the uh, rent extraction component. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this um, uh, in terms of this. I won't ask a question about rent extraction on the exam. Um, so as far as monopolists, I'm only going to ask questions about probably dead weight loss, uh, the profits of the monopoly. Uh, but in the, in the homework assignment, what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to go through consumer and producer surplus so you could see uh, exactly what happens under the monopolist, right? It's not just that consumers lose surplus, it's that the monopolist extracts surplus from them, what we call rent extraction, okay? So again, on the uh, exam, I'm only going to ask you questions about profits uh, and dead weight loss uh, with respect to the monopoly. So you should feel comfortable calculating profits calculating dead weight loss. As far as consumer and producer surplus, uh, that takes too long, as you no doubt experienced while you were completing the exam, or uh, completing the assignment. 
um, okay and then lastly um, I this is again just something I wanted you to go through as an exercise so this question I sort of asked you to compare the monopolist outcome to the outcome if we had a three dollar cap um, in this particular market and the basic gist of it is is that the outcome um, in fact would be exactly the same in terms of how many units get sold in the market and what price consumers pay for it. So in other words, essentially, uh, the monopolist here uh, is just like a $3 tax placed into an otherwise competitive market. So again, it's, this is about kind of realizing that we can now tie the, the sort of inefficiencies that we saw under taxation, and we can, we can talk about them in the context of monopolist. Basically, a monopolist imposes a $3 tax on the market, if you want to think about it that way. That's the way I think about it, right? Monopolist prices above marginal cost effectively means that consumers are paying like a monopolist tax, if you will. And I just, again, I wanted you to kind of go through this process and see that the monopolist in this situation is essentially equivalent to a $3 tax in this particular market with one key difference. Uh, what's the key difference between the tax and the monopolist? Yeah, yeah. So the difference is is that uh, under the monopolist, uh, they rent extract that go that that loss of consumer surplus goes to the monopolist, whereas under the tax, uh, the society in a sense gets the tax revenue. So if you if, if from an economic perspective, if you were to ask me what would be better, this monopolist or a three dollar tax, I would argue that the tax is slightly better than the monopolist because at least society generates the tax revenue. Whereas the monopolist just that's additional profits to the monopolist, but it's 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 hard to say really in this scenario, right? Because at the end of the day, the three dollar tax and the monopolist produces the exact same deadweight loss. So from an inefficiency perspective, they're just as inefficient. It really comes down to: Do you think it's better for the government to get tax revenue, or do you think it's better for the monopolist to get additional profits, right? And that's a bit of a judgment call. Questions. Okay, great. Um, and then lastly, uh, we had uh, a relatively simple um, game theory game, um, Schnippers and Shake Shack, so a New York-centric game. Um, what do you guys like prefer, Shake Shack or Schnippers? What do you mean, what is Schnippers? It's like right, it's like right over there on Chambers. It's good. Schnippers is good. It's, 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 it's a, like a burger place. Go to Schnippers. It's like really close. Just Put Schnippers into, uh, yeah, it's over on Chambers, right? Yeah. It's, or no, it's, yeah, Church. Yeah, that's where it is, Church. Schnippers is good. They have really good, like, sweet potato fries. And the hot dog, yeah, absolutely. I actually have a slight preference for, I love the small burgers at Schnippers. I like these, like, a small, like, it's good. Anyway, check it out. Okay. So, let's get to the actual game theory here. Um, so, first question is, what are the strategies for each firm? Right, we want to figure out if we have dominant or mixed strategies here. Um, so let's just go through. Um, for Shake Shack, um, when Schnippers advertises, uh, Shake Shack advertises and gets 100, or they don't advertise and get 70. Clearly, Shake Shack would prefer to advertise when Schnippers advertises. And then if Schnippers doesn't advertise, again, uh, Shake Shack gets 110 if they advertise versus 60 if they don't. Um, so we can safely say that Shake Shack has a dominant strategy to advertise, right? Because regardless of what Schnippers does, uh, Shake Shack does better um, by advertising, right? So we can, again, we can safely say Shake Shack has a dominant strategy uh, to advertise. Um, then we look at the other side. We ask ourselves, what does Schnippers want to do? So when Shake Shack advertises, Sh Schnippers advertises and gets 80 or doesn't advertise and gets 40. So when uh, Shake Shack advertises, Schnippers also uh, wants to advertise. Um, and then when Shake Shack doesn't advertise, Schnippers advertises and gets 40 or doesn't advertise uh, and gets 60. So here we see that uh, uh, Schnippers has a mixed strategy. So when Shake Shack advertises, Schnippers wants to advertise. When Shake Shack doesn't advertise, Schnippers doesn't want to advertise. So we have, again, this mixed strategy. Um, but... Because we know that um, 
Shake Shack has a dominant strategy always to advertise. And further, because we know the best response for Schnippers when they believe that Shake Shack will advertise is to also advertise, then the advertise, advertise uh, is our Nash equilibrium. So uh, this outcome right here uh, would be our Nash equilibrium. Uh, again, because we know Shake Shack is always going to advertise, and then Schnippers is going to play their best response to that, because Schnippers knows this. Right? If, you look at the, if you look at the question I tell you, they know the payoffs of each other. So Schnippers knows Shake Shack's payoffs, Shake Shack knows Schnippers' payoff, payoffs, and so that's how we get at that particular result. Um, any questions as to why that's the Nash equilibrium? Yes? So what Schnippers does, they always choose advertise. But they wouldn't not. They, Schnippers knows that Shake Shack's going to advertise, and they do worse by not advertising when Shake Shack advertises. So in a sense, it would be irrational for Schnippers not to advertise. That's why it's the Nash equilibrium. Yes. I mean, well, the, the Nash equilibrium is the outcome, right? It's, it's the combination of two strategies. But the, the, yeah, wherever the dominant is, that's, yeah, that's where the Nash is going to play. Yep, absolutely. Because it's dominant. We know they're going to play there, right? That, that's why we call it a dominant strategy, because we know they're going to play it regardless. Questions? So this actually ties in a lot to actual oligopolies. One of the things we see in oligopolistic markets is a heavy amount of advertising. Because think about it. In perfect competition, there's no reason to advertise essentially, because there's so many other firms, it really doesn't matter, right? In a monopoly, there's no reason to advertise because you don't have any other competitors, right? So you don't really have to worry about it. Uh, in both monopolistic competition as well as in oligopolies, advertising is very important. In monopolistic competition, it's important because you want to tell people how your product is different from everyone else's, right? That's the key in monopolistic competition is product differentiation. So in monopolistic competition, advertising is important because it's, it tells people how your product is different. Um, in oligopolies, um, we see advertising is very important because it's a relatively small number of firms. And what firms want to do is they want to uh, uh, build brand loyalty. I couldn't even talk the other day. They want to build brand loyalty. And so if you think about it, think about the commercials you see on a daily basis. Like you watch TV, right? Car commercials, airline commercials, beauty products, clothes products, food products. All <coughs> excuse me. All oligopolistic markets. So if you actually think about where most of the advertising comes from, it comes from oligopolistic markets. Because that becomes the way in which oligopolistic firms are able to try to distinguish themselves from other oligopolistic firms, is to try to build brand loyalty, and they do this through marketing. And we see companies like Apple that are very successful at this. Right? Apple has, has taken their marketing campaign and essentially has made themselves one of the richest companies to ever exist um, by virtue of an extremely good marketing campaign. You'll actually see that the slideshows in talk.